Hi, this is Fish and welcome to Fish Picks. In this recording, we're going to be taking a look at the eight elements that in combination determine how challenging a lock is to pick. And to illustrate this, we're going to be using these three locks, all part of the master lock range. We're going to be using the uh, master lock 140, the master lock number five, and finally the master lock 570. So the first of the eight elements that determine how challenging a lock is to pick is the keyway. And of course, it's the keyway that determines the access that we have to the uh, lock mechanism in the first place. On the master lock 140, which is the simplest of the three locks I'm sharing with you today, you'll notice that we've got a very open keyway. It isn't paracentric in that you've got um, a clear line of access through the center line of the lock here. And that makes this a really easy lock to access with a range of different pick profiles. If I then move on to the number five, now we have the M1 keyway. Um, it is paracentric because we've got this little bit of warding here um, towards the bottom of the keyway, which makes it a little more challenging to pick. Um, and that deter is determined by whether you're using top or bottom of the keyway tension and how much space you have left to play in the keyway. For an experienced picker, this isn't a problem. There are much more challenging keyways than this one, but you can definitely see the difference between these two. And so that's the first challenge. And if we then compare that to the 570, you'll see that it's essentially the same keyway, although in this case, it's reversed. So the master lock 570 uses a reverse M1. Um, again, it's equal in terms of level of difficulty, although depending on whether you're a, re a right or left-handed picker, that might present its own challenges. The second element is more difficult to demonstrate using the locks themselves. And so I've created this impromptu model using poker chips because now we're going to be looking at the idea of tolerances. You can think of tolerances as the quality of machining that's been used to build the lock itself. Each of these poker chips is going to represent an air and bird's eye view of one of the holes that's been milled through the Bible and into the core of the lock and in which the springs and the pin sit. In a perfectly machined lock, you would have each of these holes being milled absolutely along a center line. And so that would be a, a high tolerance lock. However, with cheaper locks, the machining process creates these really subtle deviations away from the center line. So in this case, pins one and three have been offset to some degree, and it might be five by fractions of a millimeter, but that's enough for us to be able to exploit in an attack. So in this case, if you could imagine that we're placing tension on this lock body, clockwise, then the first pin to bind is going to be pin number one. So once that's been picked, that will then give us access to pin to pins two, four, and five, um, leaving pin three, the last of the pins to bind. So if we remove those from play, once we've picked this pin, we will then find ourselves in an open position. And tolerances can be quite tricky really in some senses because a lock like the master lock 140 has low tolerances but that doesn't necessarily make it easier to pick because it might do it might be that it reveals a really straightforward binding order that allows me to get decent feedback but it could be that the feedback is mushier or more difficult to read because of the nature of the uh, milling so um, that makes the uh, ordering or the creating of a progressive lock system quite challenging because one master lock 140 might be really straightforward to open and another master lock 140 with just different tolerances um, could be very difficult. The third element to consider when exploring how challenging a lock is to pick is the issue of springs. So these three locks 
demonstrate this perfectly really. The Masterlock 140 has a fairly simple spring system that is neither too hard nor too squishy and so the feedback from this lock isn't too bad at all. The master lock number four has a really strong set of springs and particularly the opening spring and I have achieved an unlock on this particular lock multiple times without realizing it and I've gone on to keep picking only to find that I had an open but the spring mechanism that releases the hasp was so strong that it, that it wasn't giving me the appropriate feedback and I had to really um, crank down on the uh, tensioning tool in order to achieve a release. And finally, when we look at the Master Lock 570, this is a dead core lock. There are no springs. And that makes this a much more difficult lock to open in that you're not getting the kind of feedback that you would expect from your tensioning. And so your tensioning has to be much more dialed in to successfully open this one. The fourth element has all to do with pinning. This is the key for the Master Lock 140, the number five, and the 570. And you'll notice that the bitting for each of these two keys indicates that it's a four pin lock, whereas the bitting for the Master Lock 570 is a five pin lock. And the number of pins will, of course, have an impact on the difficulty of the pick. But in addition to that, something that's not shown here by the key profiles is the kinds of pins that you're dealing with. So the first two locks, the 140 and the number 5, are composed of standard pins only. But the Master Lock 570 is chocked full of security pins, um, primarily, I believe, spools. And on really high-end locks, it won't just be the driver pins that have security locks in them, but it can be the key pins as well. And these security pins come in an assortment of different colours and flavours. So you can look at spools, you can be looking at serrated pins, mushrooms and all kinds of kind of homebrew uh, security pins that you find in some challenge locks. The fifth element and the last one to be associated with the mechanism of the lock itself is that of bitting. So the bitting is the, are the series of cuts in a key that relate to the size of the key pins. And as a general rule, the more peaks and troughs that you find on a key, the more challenging it will be to pick. And not only that, but the order in which the peaks and troughs appear can make a huge difference to the experience that you have picking. So a high, low, high or a low, high, low uh, sequence can mean that it's very easy to overset pins in the process of trying to get to the back of the lock. Actually, in this case, all three of the master lock pin uh, keys here have reasonable bitting profiles, whereas many that I've seen have a more even series uh, of uh, cuts, and that makes them very susceptible to raking. But if I move these aside, you'll notice that I've got two of the locks from the Sparrow's Progressive Lock series and even though this lock which is pinned for four pins should be easier to pick than this lock which is pinned with five my experience has always been that lock number four is a much more difficult open to achieve than lock number five and the reason becomes clear when you take a look at the bitting on these keys so if i zoom in on that you'll see that the pins, or the, the bitting sequence for number five, that's the one on the bottom here, is far more straightforward and the peaks and troughs have far less variance than the bitting, which is quite extreme on number four. And particularly if you look at that one cut, which is really uh, low down there, um, it was very easy to overset that pin whilst trying to reach to the back for pins uh, three and four. And you do need to bear this in mind when you're coming to pick a lock, because even if it's a lock that has a relatively low ranking on the subreddit, for example, and is identified as a white or a yellow belt lock, it could be that the bitting order of the particular key that you're working with makes it a more challenging lock than somebody else's identical model just because they've got a more straightforward bitting order.
The last three elements have nothing to do with the lock itself, but more to do with the lock picker. And so number six in, of the eight elements is the choice of pick profile that you make. Each of these pick heads has a different shape and a different neck, and that will lend itself to being perfectly designed for a particular lock picking situation. And knowing which pick profile to use in order to avoid oversetting and to be able to reach the desired pin effectively and efficiently through the warding of the keyway uh, and through the bitting that you, you're facing is really all about experience. Likewise, element number seven is to do with tensioning. Are you going to go with top of the keyway tensioning or bottom of the keyway tensioning? It, sometimes a lock will respond to one kind of tensioning better than another. Um, the kind of keyway that you're using, the warding, the access to the pins themselves will all determine which of these tools is best suited to achieve an open. And finally, number eight of the eight elements is the idea of picking technique. It might well be that you've got the right tools, you've got the right um, conditions, but you just don't have the skill yet. And that's certainly been my experience as a newcomer to lock sport. It's a really subtle and long journey and you have to have the patience to develop the specific techniques and to be able to understand and read the feedback that the lock's giving you in order to secure the open. So there you have it. Eight elements that I think are useful for taking into consideration when determining how challenging a lock might be to open. So we have the keyway, tolerances, the springs, the pins, driver pins and key pins, the bitting of the lock that you're working on, the pick profile, tensioning and the picking technique. And these eight elements in combination will determine whether you do or don't achieve an open. So having looked at the varying elements of each of these three locks in turn, it remains only to find out whether I can open them today and if I can, how long it takes me. So let's see how we get along with picking the master lock 140. I'm using top of the keyway tension and uh, I believe this is a gem profile on the pick. So just feeling in, put a small click on two, one is binding. And there we go. So it's a really nice and straightforward uh, lock for a beginner such as myself. It's a nice confidence builder. So now I'm going to be picking the master lock number five. This time I'm going with bottom of the keyway tension using the same pick. So one is springy, two is binding, but getting very mushy feedback on this one. really no clicks coming through at all. But I have got an open there, even though I felt very little going on inside the lock body itself. So this is a really clear example of what I was talking about earlier when it comes to um, spring tension. Finally, we'll have a go at the master lock 570. I switch back to top of the keyway tension for this one and uh, it may well be that I need to speed up the recording so that you're not sitting there for hours watching this if I achieve an open at all. Let's see how we do. So one is springy. I've got a small click out of two, click out of three big click out of four, I suspect I might have overset it. One of the challenges of the 570 is that um, the spool pins don't give you a really clear false set in the way that some of the other security pin locks that I've worked with do. 
And so there you go, I've got the false set now. And I'm looking for that counter rotation. But because it's a dead core, it's really hard to find it. You actually have got to release tension off really purposefully. So there's no effort whatsoever on the tensioning bar to try and figure out where the counter rotation is. And this is the point I often struggle with this lock. So let's see what I can do. So I'm working my way up and down the pins, feeling for what's going on. But not getting very far at the moment. So trying to find the binding order on the 570 at the moment for my skill level is the challenge. So I keep feeling like I'm moving into a, a deeper false set, but it's really subtle. Then it feels like it's resetting again. So I might be dropping pins. It could just be part of the spools moving to different parts of the spools. All right, I'm going to go quiet for a moment because I'm too busy trying to narrate rather than concentrate. Let's see if I can get this. Yes, and we did get an open there, even though I dropped the tensioning tool at the end. So I think that demonstrates nice and clearly what I was talking about in terms of uh, the progressive challenge that these three locks offer. Um, so we did get an open on all three in the end. Um, but look at the time that it took and the focus that it required for me to achieve the open on the 570 in comparison to the relative ease with which I was able to open the other two locks.